Hello, my name's Dr. Alice Wirt, and thank you for coming to my webinar on application of molecular methods in diagnostic microbiology. So my plan today is to uh, introduce myself and where I work, discuss a bit of the background around uh, molecular microbiology, and then I'm going to look at the different molecular microbiology methods, uh, briefly so serology and antigen testing, proteonomics, nucleic acid amplification tests, point of care tests, what's done at the reference laboratory, and then what the future challenges are for molecular microbiology. So to start with introducing myself, I'm Dr. Alice Wirt. I'm a consultant microbiologist at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Gateshead. For those of you who are from inside or outside the country and don't maybe know where Gateshead is, then um, we are just over the river from Newcastle upon Tyne, which is um, usually quite famous for its football club. The, um, the joint clinical lead for microbiology for South of Tyne and Weir Clinical Pathology Services. And my special interests are in paediatric microbiology and molecular uh, microbiology or molecular pathology and infection. Um, I have a PhD in paediatric pneumonia and as part of that, I did um, manual PCR testing of um, paediatric respiratory samples. And uh, one of my claims to fame is I finished my PhD in um, 2019, was that I did uh, possibly the last coronavirus tests in the Northeast before the pandemic. So um, I work in the pathology center which is a massive um, laboratory um, on the Queen Elizabeth Hospital site in Gateshead. And this is a real life picture of our laboratory. It is a very impressive um, setup. Um, and the reason it's so big and impressive is because we cover a very large area. So we provide all the microbiology testing for three different hospitals, the Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Gateshead, South Tyneside General Hospital, which is in South Tyneside, and Sunderland Royal Hospital, which is in Sunderland. Uh, we're the largest NHS laboratory in the region and as you can see we're a state-of-the-art pathology centre. Uh, we were opened in 2015 um, and we're designed along lean principles um, but with flexibility and expansion in mind. So for the microbiology part of the lab um, our main focus is on high throughput screening. So um, you know we do a lot of tests uh, all day every day. Um, we also very much focusing on rapid results, so that's why molecular methods are so important to us. Um, and our main focus is on patient care. We want to provide good clinical results and improve patient result, patient care. Um, we offer a 24 hour, seven day a week service. So we have a biomedical scientist on site all the time, processing, analyzing and reporting on urgent results. And we have a very bold vision for the future um, and we're keen to improve and expand our services. So a bit of a disclaimer though about this talk that it's very much my personal experiences as a microbiologist in Gateshead and things, so therefore it's very region specific uh, and UK specific. So things vary from region to region and throughout the world, but I'm afraid you're stuck with my own experiences. So the background, um, microbiology is going through a revolution. I mean, all the pathology services are always evolving, but I think, we're a little bit late to the game. So if you talk to the hematologists or the biochemists, they've definitely been through this revolution already. Um, you know, from sort of the days where you had lots of very qualified biomedical scientists in laboratories working away, producing results, but tests took days and you got very good quality, you know, science, but it, it just took time and patience to do. Um, and the other thing that's changed in a big way is the way we set up our microbiology services. So traditionally, we would sort of divide our services down the virology and bacteriology lines. So um, the virologists would look after the virology and serology, um, and then the microbiologists would look after the bacteriology and the mycology. But that's changing because of these new molecular methods. And the new divide sort of comes along between culture and molecular. So things that take days to grow, and then things that we can um, do very rapidly just straight away with molecular methods and the advantage is a kind of speed versus accuracy so you can get a very quick answer from a molecular method um, but it's not always the whole answer whereas if you take your time and do things carefully and slowly 
through culture, you might get a more uh, reliable or accurate answer, but it, it just takes longer. So if you look at culture in itself uh, as a technique for microbiology, it has advantages. It's you know, very widely available. Um, it's, it's inexpensive and it, although it takes qualified, trained, experienced biomedical scientists, it doesn't take a lot of complicated equipment. You need agar plates, you need incubators, and then you need experienced people to be able to tell you what, what the pathogens are that are growing. And it also provides you with uh, reliable and reproducible antimicrobial susceptibility data. The disadvantages, as I've already said, are it's slower. Um, it's not species specific. So, you know, uh, whilst very good experienced biomedical scientists can reliably identify um, pathogens and bacteria from their growth, not everybody can, and it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, it only detects living organisms. So the, the, the bacteria have to grow to be able to, um, um, to, for that to work. And it can't identify all bacteria, you know, so there are intracellular bacteria that it doesn't identify and fastidious bacteria that you just cannot get to grow. And it just can't, you know, we can grow viruses in cell culture, but again, very diff technically difficult, laborious and time consuming. So, you know, it's not, it's not the answer to everything. Um, so no talk would be complete without talking about SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. Um, and it has changed everything for laboratory science, not just for um, the world as a whole. Um, so in Gateshead, we have a new laboratory, uh, a COVID laboratory, um, which was set up in, well, uh, it really started in April 2020. So we're coming up to our second year anniversary. Um, and as you can see here, um, this graph shows you that the turnaround times have consistently come down on our, our testing for uh, SARS-CoV-2, whilst the number of samples we're testing has consistently gone up. So we, we've been offering a very good service. But the way we've done that is um, quite phenomenal, really. You know, we've, we've very much had to pull in our, all our skills from right across pathology. So one of the things we, we did was um, a biochemist came and joined us and biochemists are very good when it comes to high throughput machines. They know how important it is that you get it right first time, because if something goes wrong early in the day and you don't pick it up, you can be thousands of samples down the line before you, you sort it out. Um, we've got lots of new equipment. We've had platform, various multiple platforms that we've worked our way through over the last two years. Um, but because of all that, we've got new skills and new understanding and, and, and new abilities. And we need to now use that in the future going forward. Um, the other thing is that's changed a great deal is, well, the public's expectations and clinicians' expectations. So the days where you could say to a patient, oh, you've probably got flu, just go home, aren't really acceptable anymore because the patients now know they can have a test for flu and they want to know the answer. And the clinicians are the same. You know, it used to be, well, what's the point in doing that test? It's not going to change your management. But actually having an answer is now, you know, important to clinicians and to patients. And so we have to bear that in, in mind when we, as we go forward. So serology and antigen testing, and this is kind of where it all began. Um, and I'm gonna talk about a little bit about science, although I suspect everyone who's listening to this webinar already knows this, but I, I like to think about serology as sandwiches and antigen testing as sandwiches. So you, you, you basically have, various combinations of antibody, antigen, antibody, or antigen, antibody, antibody. And it all comes down to pretty much the same thing that at the end of the day you have, if what you're testing is there, you have a, a, an antibody that, you know, early on used to give out fluorescence that we'd look for through a microscope, but now we have ways of quantifying that and reading it automatically. Um, and it, you know, it's, it has many advantages, but we'll go through that a bit closer. Um, one of the problems with serology or one of the downsides is it's a surrogate for infection. It's not actually a direct test of infection. So what we're doing is looking at how your body has reacted to an infection. Um, and it has its advantages, you know, it's molecular, it's rapid, it's easy and it's reliable. So if you do the same test in the same conditions, you'll get the same answer. Whereas anyone who, who's worked in a culture lab knows that you can try growing up the same organism twice and it just from the same sample and it just won't do it. Um, 
but the disadvantages are that you know it's very much dependent on the patient and the patient's immune system so if they're immunosuppressed then they're not going to respond to the infection in the way that you can detect it waning immunity is definitely um a big issue i mean we found in uh, may 2020 we tested antibodies for SARS-CoV-2 and we found at least probably a handful of, of, of um, medics or, or, or clinicians who we know were PCR positive but tested antibody negative and these weren't unwell um, people or immunosuppressed they were fit healthy clinicians but they just hadn't produced an antibody to to the um, to their SARS-CoV-2 infection. Cross-reactivity is an issue, so we know that um, CMV and EBV can cross-react. And then also just natural variation. I mean, nearly all of um, laboratory medicine is based on standard curves, standard deviations. And just because you're at one end of the standard deviation does not mean you're abnormal. It just means that you don't produce the same results as the people in the middle of the curve. Um, so in Gateshead, we again, going back to the point that we're a high throughput screening laboratory, we don't do much in the way of specialized serology. We do very much high level screening um, serology. Um, and one of the ways we do this is we do it on our biochemistry platforms. So our biochemists have done a lot of our antibody screening. So for example, they um, did all the SARS-CoV-2 antibody screening. And this is the um, module that we have from the SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, uh, not so sorry, sorry. This is the module we have in the biochemistry um, uh, tract, and you can see it's part of a much bigger tract that takes up half the half the laboratory that you saw at the beginning. Um, and on, on that, we can do um, HIV, hepatitis A, B, and C. But then we also have um, other machines. So we have a VIDAS, which is the one down in the corner there. Um, and we can test EBV, CMV, rubella, measles, VZV. We also um, test for things other than viruses. So we do toxoplasmosis, syphilis, and mycoplasma IgM. Um, then we have various ways of testing for antigens as well and toxins. So for C. difficile, we have the uh, Gemini, which is shown there, the nice big machine, and that does GDH and toxin testing. Um, and then we have, um, we test for Legionella and pneumococcal urinary antigens on that little um, platform down here. Uh, this little platform. There we are. And um, we also do uh, antistreptolysin O titers and then antibiotic levels for gentamicin and vancomycin. Again, those are done on our biochemistry tract. So um, we work we work across our pathology laboratory with our with our biochemistry uh, colleagues. Um, so now I'm going to talk about proteomics, and this is one of my absolute favourites. And I think this is where the start of the microbiology molecular revolution came. So for me, I started my microbiology training in 2010 in Newcastle upon Tyne, and we were just uh, introducing a, a raw detox um, at that time. And you know, I just think having a laser in your laboratory is is the ultimate achievement because I just love it, um, and it. You know, it came in so that when it came in, it, we were just starting to change over to it, and it taught us so much so quickly. So, you know, within minutes, you are able to identify bacteria to, uh, you know, species level that, you know, we it was identifying bacteria we'd never heard of. It was um, proving that we were quite we were wrong more more times than we realised, and in identifying bacteria. Um, you know, and it just, it, it's just an amazing piece of equipment that I think it's really revolutionized how we work and is, is now an absolutely vital part of our, our laboratory. Um, so um, the disadvantages are it can't give you sensitivities. Although I would say that's not necessarily true because by giving you a good name, then you do know what, or you have a good in indication of what antibiotics it's going to be sensitive to. So, you know, you know if it's a staph aureus and you don't have a high rate of MRSA, which we don't, then the flucloxacillin is going to work. You know if it identifies an Enterococcus faecium that you're limited in what you can treat that with. You know, so it, it does give you very good, quick clinical information. The other thing I really like about it is it doesn't use much in the way of consumables. So it's very good for the environment. Um, 
So what I've shown you so far is that we have a lot of analyzers in the laboratory. Um, and I thought I should sort of discuss this a bit because that's often what molecular um, microbiology is about. And there are advantages to this. So having a mixed economy and mixed load of platforms means that you're not dependent on one platform. And that's very important if there's a failure. So if, if, you're, if you're very dependent on one platform to test everything, if it goes down, you're in a lot of trouble and you can't do anything until that platform comes back up. But if you've got lots of multiple platforms, then yes, you might have one test that goes down for a day, but you can carry on doing all the rest of your work whilst you get in the engineers to get the problem fixed. The same is true of consumables. If you've got a platform that, if you've got one system that you're dependent on all your consumables for, and then there's a, a, a supply issue, which we've had a lot of those during the pandemic, then that becomes a problem. Whereas if you've got a mixed economy with lots of platforms, then if one platform, the consumables are no longer available, you just switch to another one. Um, there are quite significant disadvantages to this, this having multiple platforms. One of them is maintenance. So you have to maintain all these different platforms. And the other one, which isn't insignificant, is training and competencies. So you have to train your staff on multiple platforms and you have to maintain the competencies on multiple platforms. It is quite often low throughput, so you're having to put just 10 samples on this platform in the morning and 10 uh, samples on this platform in the morning. Um, and the other issue is connectivity to your um, laboratory uh, information management system, your LIM system. So you've got to make all these machines talk to your, um, your LIM system, otherwise you're going to end up introducing human error as you try and um, transcribe results across. So let's move on to nucleic acid amplification tests. So I spoke about um, sandwiches and now I'm going to talk about soup. Um, and I'm sure um, those watching this webinar probably know all about how real-time PCR works, but I'll just go through the basics, um, partly because I just think it's such beautiful science um, so that we all, all know what we're talking about. So the reason I call it a soup is because it is, that's, I always see it like that you put in your, um, sample which you've denatured and extracted um, you put in your bases and your primers your primers are the, are the small bits of um, RNA or DNA that attach to the, the sequence that you're looking for and then you put in your wonderful TACMAN which is this amazing enzyme um, and you've got all the ingredients in your soup and then you put it into your light cycler and you heat it up and it um, separates out the strands of DNA or RNA, and then you cool it down a bit and the enzyme gets working and replicates, and then you heat it up again, and it just goes through these wonderful cycles. And if, if the target sequence is there, you'll get this beautiful exponential growth um, through um, usually some sort of fluorescent um, uh, marker, or well, any sort of marker, but that grows, and you get this beautiful exponential curve, and you get a CT value at which point you know it's definitely positive and taking off. Um, so there are some big advantages to uh, real-time PCR. It's quick, um, although when I say it's quick, it's quick from a point of view of modern methods with um, modern automated machines. Um, when I was doing my PhD, it could take um, all day to get the extraction done, to get the master mix made, to get it all together and then into the light cycler. Um, it's very sensitive, it's very specific. Um, now we can automate it, so nearly all of the methods I'm going to talk about, you pretty much load your sample and walk away. Um, it's quantifiable in certain circumstances, but again, you have to have the right denominator. Um, and it picks up viable and non-viable um, um, pathogens. Now this is an advantage and a disadvantage. So for things like if you've got a patient with suspected meningitis, you can't wait to give them the antibiotics. They have, you know, or sepsis, you have to give them the antibiotics straight away. But then you can do the PCR test on the CSF later, and that will um, still tell you the result, even if you've been successful in killing off the um, bacteria with the antibiotics. The disadvantages are it's expensive, and even to this day, with the mass amount of um, SARS-CoV testing we're doing, it's it is the consumables and the platforms um, and the reagents that are expensive. Um, you know, compared to an agar plate and an incubator, it's, it, it's much more difficult. Um, it's narrow spectrum, so it's very species specific. You will only you will only find what you're looking for. So if you're looking for a particular target sequence, you will only find that. 
Um, and the problem with that is, that we, as we know through SARS-CoV-2, is if you get mutations, then all of a sudden you'll get gene dropout. If you're only looking for one gene, that's it, you won't pick it up at all. Um, and it's got limited antimicrobial susceptibility data. So we can do um, testing for um, antimicrobial susceptibility. In particular, we look for CPE um, targets like OXA48, but if it's not the target that you're looking for, it's something, another mechanism or another system, you won't pick it up, but it might still be a CPE. So as I said at the beginning, we are very much a high throughput qualitative um, testing laboratory, uh, and we specialize in screening. So the human papillomavirus, uh, we are, have the contract to do all of the human papillomavirus uh, cervical cancer screening for the north of England. So not just the northeast, we go pretty much all the way across to Cumbria or down to Yorkshire and beyond. Um, and we have a huge network of um, logistics that go to every GP in the region and collect these samples. But this again has absolutely revolutionized um, cervical screening because when we set up this and got going at the time, it would take sort of five to six weeks for a cervical screening sample to be um, you know, properly analyzed and reported. And we were being able to um, produce these reports in 72 hours if they were uh, HPV negative. And we were getting phone calls from GPs saying, there's something wrong here, this isn't my patient, you know, this result's too quick. And it's like, no, that's what we can do now. Um, but this did mean that when the pandemic came along, and we were very lucky in that we had some impressive machinery that we could use. So this here closer is a, a Cobas 8800, and this is a Cobas 6800. These are both in our HPV testing laboratory. Um, we also have a Cobas 6800 in our main laboratory area in the, in the main lab. And then we now have a Cobas 8800 up in our COVID testing laboratory. So yes, as, from a point of view of platforms, we are, we're, we're very lucky in that we've got some very good platforms that can do a lot of high throughput testing. The disadvantage is if, if consumables become an issue um, or kits and reagents become limited because then you suddenly haven't got any um, ability to switch around. We also do um, chlamydia and gonorrhea screening on, for sexual health uh, screening on our 6800 in our main laboratory. Um, you can do quantitative PCR on the COBAS uh, 6800 and 8800, but this is where we get into this being a high throughput screening laboratory versus a specialist laboratory. And we don't do the HIV levels or hepatitis B or hepatitis C um, levels in our laboratory. We refer them um, to Newcastle, which I'll talk a bit about later, but we don't have the, the numbers to make it worthwhile. So as soon as you're doing a test that um, you only do a few of, you know, a week or a day, it becomes limited by the amount of controls you have to run. So what, what could be a viable test becomes too expensive and, and too difficult to run because you're having to um, constantly run lots of um, negative and positive controls. Um, and then with respiratory secretions, it's very difficult. I think with SARS-CoV-2, we do all look at CT values. In particular, we very much use the CT values for if we send them off for sequencing. So if something has a CT value of over 30, we're not allowed to send it off for sequencing. And that's through experience that they very rarely are able to sequence anything that has a CT value of over 30. But, and we can, as clinicians, see, as microbiology clinicians, see the um, the CT values and it does, we, we have got familiar with, you know, what's likely to be early infection, what's likely to be, you know, good going uh, um, infection and what's, what's a late or uh, um, recovered infection. But you, you, you just never know about the quality of the sample you've got. So you don't know what your denominator is. So it could be that they took a really good deep sample. It could be that they took a very poor sample at the front of the nose. They couldn't get much because it was a child screaming. Or it could be that they just didn't even take the sample at all. And you just, so you can't give out CT values on respiratory secretions, but you can use some um, specialist judgment to look at them. Um, batch qualitative. So actually this slide should be in two parts because um, we do batch qualitative PCR 
for um, herpes simplex virus, and we're introducing, we're, we're just validating a new um, platform, um, Syroset platform to test that on. Um, and that's because um, at the moment we do send those out, but we're going to bring those back in because we, you get a lot of those through, again, the sexual health services. Um, and then um, fecal PCR is possibly where things have really started to change for PCR. So we do bacterial fecal PCR in our laboratory and we're just about to start doing a project looking uh, to add in. So we do, at the moment we do Salmonella, Campylobacter and E. coli 0157, but we're going to add in um, Yericinia, Cryptosporidium um, and something else, which I can't remember off the top of my head. But I think what's really important is that this is bacterial PCR and it's clinically relevant and real-time bacterial PCR. So um, once a day, we run a batch of these um, and it, it, it's completely transformed, well, two things. One, from a public health point of view, because our, our numbers have shot up, but that's not because we've, you know, there's been an actual increase in the amount of Campylobacter, Salmonella and E. coli 157 around. It's because we've got we're picking it up now because we've got a much more sensitive technique. And what we're finding is when we send them to the reference laboratory, some of them do grow, some of them don't grow. And even some of the ones that we managed to grow on our, in our laboratory don't grow when they get to the, to the reference laboratory. And I think that shows you how um, the limitations of culture are that, you know, these, these organisms are dying in transit. And so, you know, they're not just going to die between us and the reference laboratory, they're going to die between the patient and the laboratory in the first place. So, you know, it's, it's made a big difference for improving our sensitivity. Um, and the public health, um, you know, officers who, or the environmental officers who go and investigate these cases tell us that they clinically always fit with, with the diagnosis. So they, they always act on them now and, and just assume that if they don't grow at the reference laboratory, that's because of they don't in transit or they you know, they just were, were, were non-viable by the time they, they got to us, but the clinical history was fits. Um, the thing from an inpatient point of view is it does offer us a much more rapid, um, or it reduces the length of stay of the patient. Because the patient comes in, you know, and they might not have had a history of being at a barbecue or at a wedding, you know, or having eaten something that from a, from a restaurant or a takeaway that they were suspicious about. Um, but they have good going diarrhea, but within, you know, 24 hours, we can give a, an initial uh, result and, you know, say this, this is Campylobacter. And it means that they can have much more confidence in stopping the antibiotics because half the time they seem to be on antibiotics for diverticulitis. They get them home and they get them back to their own toilets and they, and they know how to manage it. Um, so um, then we're moving on to our biofire. And this is actually what's pictured here is the biofire. It's um, a, a um, yeah, this is a biofire. This is a, an open access platform. So um, it's a good, pretty much a rapid platform actually, but we have one of these down in our main laboratory. Um, and where this has really revolutionized um, our testing is in um, CSF testing. Um, um, so prior to getting the biofire and um, testing the biofire, we used to send all our samples to the reference laboratory in Newcastle who had a sort of semi-automated system, but it only ran um, Monday to Friday and they only did one run a day. And so you had to have your sample there by nine o'clock in the morning and you'd get a result back about uh, 4.30 in the afternoon. Um, and that was it. Whereas now this is open access. So you send us a sample any time of day or night. Um, We've got a biomedical scientist in the laboratory who will prepare it, do the ground stain, but also put it onto the biofire if it meets the criteria and will give you a result, usually within an hour. I always say two hours to the clinicians just to be on the safe side, but you know, you'll know you get a result in an hour. And we have already seen massive improvements in patient care because of this. We've had patients who've been HSV positive who weren't on um, treatment acyclovir or any treatment at all. Um, I had a, a neonate the other day who came in unwell, CSF, we had a very good biomedical scientist who managed to see um, scanty gram positive cocci on the um, uh, ground stain, but we then put it through this, uh, through the biofire, and it told us it was a group B strep, which completely fitted clinically, but just to be able to give that 
definite answer quickly made a big difference, especially when they then transferred out to a tertiary centre. Um, so it, it's really, it, and it, the other thing is that the, the, the old system in Newcastle only tested for viruses, whereas this tests for viruses, bacteria and um, uh, cryptococcal. So, you know, it's, it's, it's brilliant. It is more expensive than the, the reference test was, but from the point of view, it's completely justifiable from improved patient care and safety. And also, when you're looking at the test reference tests versus in-house tests, you always have to make sure you take into account things like, you know, the packaging of the sample and the sending it away. That's really important to make sure that you, you get the whole cost of sending a reference sample away, not just what they're charging you at the reference uh, unit end. Um, the biofire has got the ability to do some other things. We do currently do a respiratory panel on it. Now, the respiratory panel is very much a viral panel. I'm, I'm not finding it as wonderfully useful as I thought I might. So, you know, para, uh, para influenza one, two, three, adenovirus, they don't really very, very rarely add anything to our patients, but we don't have any immunosuppressed transplant patients. Um, so the um, paediatricians in Sunderland, they like it. They like it because it gives them an answer. So back to what I was saying early on, that it maybe doesn't change management, but being able to have an answer helps them just know what they're, they're doing. Um, so that they, they like it, but I, I very, I, I'm, I tend to, sometimes I do ask for it in, in intensive care, but most of the time, um, it, that's the only time we would use it. And it is on a, because it, again, it's very expensive. It's very much on a consultant request basis. Um, but, um, you know, it, it does, have, does work from that point of view. The other, um, Thing that we've looked at bringing in is it tests for joint fluid you can do joint fluids on it and it tests for sort of various common um, findings in joint fluid but we're a bit skeptical about whether or not that will help because in those situations speed isn't really an issue i think where these these um, techniques work best is where speed is an issue meningitis sepsis you know where you're trying to get patients home quickly but when you've got somebody who's got a joint infection what's really important is the right answer. And, and then it becomes about sensitivities as well. So, you know, knowing that, knowing what, um, what bacteria it is doesn't necessarily, quickly doesn't necessarily change what you're gonna do in the long term at all. Um, so rapid PCR, um, and I, I think anything which we call rapid PCR, uh, we're talking about within one hour, um, the beauty of this is you can do it outside the laboratory. Um, so um, the, what you can see there is a photo on the right of me stood next to our new infinity, which I absolutely love. Um, and below is our gene experts. And these are all from Kefid. So Kefid uh, is an American company. And, you know, these are very much rapid uh, PCR techniques. You get a cartridge, you put your sample in, load it on and you press go. And it's brilliant. And it can be used we, we have um, these gene experts are uh, tabletop size, and we have one in the accident and emergency department in Sunderland, one in the accident and emergency department in South Tyneside, uh, and then we have one in our COVID laboratory uh, up on our main site, which our uh, accident and emergency here in Gateshead use, and they're, they're absolutely vital now for um, patient flow, for managing patients quickly so that they can be identified if they've got SARS-CoV-2 at the front door and then sent to the appropriate areas that way. Um, but um, down in the main laboratory, we have this new infinity, which uh, we're just trying to get the final, we've done the validation on it, but we're just going to try to get the final connectivity done. But um, that will use for um, CPE testing, for C. diff PCR testing, Nora and rotavirus testing, and also, you know, there are other tests that we can look at bringing online. So I'm very keen to look at doing TB PCR. Um, I think um, that will help speed up being able to start patients on treatment and the right treatment. Because I think whilst, I think, well, it's very difficult TB management when we send all our samples to the reference laboratory, but actually sometimes you just need to know it isn't TB so that you can move on and look for something else. And then if it is TB, you're very, you know, you've got an answer straight away. So that, it's very good. And the other thing that I'm 
keen to explore, but we'll probably have to do some sort of um, clinical trial, is actually uh, looking at doing group A strep testing, uh, rapid testing, PCR testing on this um, for throat swabs, because as we're moving sort of, I would say out of the pandemic, although it doesn't feel like it at the moment, um, we, um, you know, we, we've, we've set up this whole infrastructure in our hospital for testing, right from taking the swabs from um, patients in the car park, right through to testing them in the laboratory. And we need to make sure that we, we have a legacy for this system and that we, we use it to the best possible use. So um, I think looking at, you know, supporting our primary care colleagues when you've got patients with sore throats and what you need to know is do they need antibiotics or not? If we can offer them a test that gives them that answer, it would be, it would improve patient care, which is what it's all about at the end of the day. Um, and then let's talk about reference laboratories because they're, they're still very important and we still need to use them. And, and there are molecular methods that, as I said, due to low throughput or low sample number, it does not make sense for everybody to be doing them. Because at the moment in the Northeast, every hospital, thanks to the pandemic, now has a PCR lab. But is that the right way of doing things going forward? So um, our main reference laboratory in our region is Newcastle Laboratories, um, which is just over the river. Um, and, and that's where our virologists are based in the region. We have just appointed a virologist um, in Sunderland, but the specialist virology services are based in Newcastle. And that makes sense because it's a quaternary hospital with solid organ transplant, bone marrow transplants. It also has um, uh, neurosurgery. So it has a lot of you know, um, specialist ser services that it has to support. So we send, once we've done the initial sort of screening tests that we do, high throughput screening tests we do, we send our, for confirmation. So our hepatitis A, B and C go for confirmation in Newcastle. Our HIVs will go for confirmation in Newcastle. Um, our syphilis is go for confirmation in Newcastle. They also do um, PCP PCR testing in Newcastle. We can't bring that in-house in, -house in uh, Gateshead, partly due to numbers, but also partly that that's the only test available for that at the moment is on the Roche flow system, which is one that seems to be the only system we don't have in Gateshead, but they do have it in Newcastle. So, and then hepatitis E um, also goes there. Um, they do more than that, but I just thought those were the sort of main day-to-day -day ones that we, we were regularly in contact with them about. Um, 16S PCR is an interesting one. Um, I think early on it, it sort of promised a lot and hasn't necessarily delivered in the way it needs to as a molecular method. It's probably become clear that the main sort of benefit of molecular methods is speed. You know what you what you lose in in information from like sensitivities and things like that you gain in speed and the problem with 16s pcr is again it doesn't really give you the speed element and you could say well if everybody had 16s pcr and did it would that provide the answers and it, it doesn't really i don't think um so its advantages are that it detects again viable and non-viable bacteria um it's got a very wide spectrum um, it allows species differentiation through sequencing, and um, it's a second line option for undetectable bacteria. And I think that's the issue is that's where it's useful. So if you've got somebody, you've got discitis, you've done the biopsy, you know there's something in there and you send it off, but you can't grow it. And you send it off for 16 SPCR, that gives you an answer, then that's, that's brilliant and that's, that's where it works. Um, same to true for heart valves that have got endocarditis that you've explanted or um, joint fluids that not grown anything you know it, it does give you those answers but it again it's not really a high screen through high throughput screening method so all ours go to Great Ormond Street um, and uh, we, we don't do very many of them at all we put mostly for us it's jo joint fluids for prosthetic joint infections um, and you know um, Culture methods are so good at, at those and, and enrichment that I think it's very rarely that we, we don't pick anything up and send it for uh, 16S PCR. Um, the dis disadvantages are that it's exactly the same as the culture methods, it's vulnerable to contamination. Um, it's slower than real time PCR, which is to say is a big disadvantage. And there's again, no antimicrobial susceptibility data. It can guide you by giving you a name, but it doesn't give you definite, you know, in vitro. 
show results. So this is this is something I'm not particularly exploring or keen to bring online in 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 um, Gateshead. We've we've sort of looked at it briefly, and we will look at it again if, as the technology evolves and the techniques evolve. But at the moment, it's not something that I think would add to patient care, which is what it's all about. Um, and then whole genome sequencing is again another ball game, and um, this is something I'm very interested in at the moment. Um, so. Uh, and this is where the, the, the pandemic's really brought to whole genome sequencing into its own from an infection point of view. I mean, obviously, from um, cancer services point of view, they've been ahead of this game for quite some time. But I think from the infection point of view, we haven't. Um, so we in early on in the pandemic, we all our sequencing was done in at Northumbria University in Newcastle, and they offered us an amazing service. So, um, for example, in um, early summer 2021, we had a patient with a significant travel history where we suspected they had Delta um, variant. Um, and uh, interestingly, it wasn't even called the Delta variant at the time, but, you know, um, we were, at the time, there was still a move to try and contain the Delta variant. Um, and so we were able to send this sample off to the Northumbria laboratory and say, we suspect this is a um, new variant coming from India, that's come from India, could you please um, look at it? And they, within 48 hours, they gave us a result that confirmed it was a Delta variant, as it was later called. And that meant that our public health colleagues were able to do proper um, tracing. It was actually a member of our staff. So, you know, we were able to do proper infection prevention control in the hospital and ensure that we protected our patients and so that was you know that was a big success for um, whole genome sequencing but the other thing that they did was in um, autumn 2020 so October November time we had significant problems with outbreaks in our hospital of SARS-CoV-2 um, and we were able to send them all the samples um, from the outbreaks and they did some beautiful um, work they sequenced them all and did some beautiful work being able to tell us which variants were, or you know, which particular variants were involved in the outbreak, um, and where they, you know, which patients and which staff were connected because the staff were involved in the outbreak. And whilst it didn't necessarily at the time change the management of the patients, it did change our management of, infect of, of outbreaks. So it just gave us much more knowledge of what was going on with the virus, how it was spreading, and how we could stop that. And that that's where it, it really came into its own. Um, unfortunately, um, for various reasons, sequencing has been nationalised and all the samples are now sequenced nationally. And the only information we get is whether or not it's a variant of concern or not. Um, we can't get any of that sort of detailed, um, you know, uh, family history related of, of different samples and that. So that's one of the reasons why I'm very keen to try and look at bringing this in-house into Gateshead and seeing if we can do our own whole genome sequencing. Um, but as we've seen from, from a SARS-CoV-2 point of view, it has huge worldwide benefits of knowing, and public health benefits of knowing how variants are moving around, how they're mutating, what's happening, you know, and, and I think that's brilliant. But from a, an individual patient point of view, we can also use it to, to improve patient care. Um, and it's not just for SARS-CoV-2, you know, uh, Staph aureus, um, candidus, if you've got a candor outbreak on your ITU, um, and then uh, CPE outbreaks, you know, all those sort of things, it would really make a difference if we could, you know, just have more knowledge and understanding of how these um, pathogens are moving around our hospital and therefore um, be able to control them better. But it's not an easy thing to do. So it's another level up of, of, of skill, platform, consumables, and mainly information technology, you know, bioscience behind it. Um, is very difficult and you need the right people with the right training. So it's a bit more aspirational at the moment, but I definitely think it's coming and I'm hoping it will come soon. Um, point of care testing. So I suppose um, certainly I think point of care testing gets bandied around quite a bit, um, but for a true point of care testing, the lateral flow is it, isn't it? Because from an infection point of view, um, it has to be at the bedside to be true point of care testing or at home. It has, you, you have to, either the patient has to be able to do it themselves. And when I say do it themselves, they have to be able to take the sample, you know, put it on whatever device it is and then analyze it themselves. 
Um, so minimal training required and it has to produce rapid results. So that's that's what true point of care is. And unfortunately, this is my uh, positive COVID test from January 2022. Um, but, um, you know, they do have their place and they do work, but um, we don't do very many of them from an infection prevention and control or a microbiology point of view. So the future. Um, the future is really full of challenges, which is exciting, and that's what the future is about. So I think one of the biggest challenges is sensitivity testing. From a bacteriology point of view, we need to know whether or not these uh, bacteria that we're identifying, what, which antibiotics are sensitive to and which ones they're not, because that's what actually changes patient management. So, you know, we can have a good guess based on the name, well, not guess, good understanding based on our scientific expertise, but at the end of the day, it, we would feel much more comf confident treating our patients with certain antibiotics if we had a result. And you do get that from um, TB testing. So there's a, a big reference laboratory here in the UK that does all the TB testing and it does it through sequencing. Um, but that's partly because um, mycobacterium tuberculosis lends itself to that because it's slow to replicate and slow to mutate. Cost, the cost needs to come down. If it doesn't come down, then it's just not going to be usable because you, you, you have to be able to justify the costs of your test. So as I said at the beginning, patients now expect answers, but what they maybe don't understand is there's a cost behind that answer. So if it's not going to change what you do or how you do it, then is it justifiable? So the costs of these molecular techniques, and they are coming down, but they need to come down further. Um, another issue is accessibility. So, you know, they, they, they're, whilst they're fairly easy to use these machines, they're not easy to maintain, they're not easy to run. Um, you know, they need electricity, they need um, qu quite complex IT systems and support. So for, for them to be truly global, that needs to improve. And then the other big thing that needs to change about molecular microbiology is the environmental impact, and particularly the amount of plastic they use. And I think we were all quite, whilst we all accepted that we needed good testing to manage the pandemic, I think it was quite horrifying how much plastic we've gone through. I mean, some of the platforms we used just use so much plastic just to produce one result. And, you know, engineering and science is all moving on. And so it should be possible to try and reduce the environmental impact of these tests. And I think that's something we really need to work on in the future. Um, and that's everything. So um, thank you very much for coming to my webinar.